So welcome to the ArtsLink Assembly. I'm Simon Dove. I'm director of CC ArtsLink. And the ArtsLink Assembly is our annual gathering of artists, arts organizations, and colleagues looking at this relationship between art, art making, art practice, and how we build and maintain a civil society. Today, I'm joined by Gay Chan and Nandita Sharma, who are um, both in Honolulu. And I'm happy they could join me on early uh, the thing. Uh, we want to talk about their collaborative projects and they, the work that they're making, which I'd really like to focus uh, on the, the project that um, you're calling Eating in Public. Uh, the theme of our assembly this year is radical hospitality. And we are really exploring what that means to both to, to share and connect, but also to build a community and relationships that go beyond old ideas of nationality and old ideas of uh, geopolitical borders. And your project, Eating in Public, seems to me to be one not only of radical hospitality, but a kind of uh, radical sharing of resources, of um, food, but also of, of, of community. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, Eating in Public? Actually, Eating in Public um, started without us knowing that we were starting something. It was in 2003 and we had by accident, a lot of papaya seedlings um, that were growing out of the yard from our, just throwing our papayas outside. So we decided that we were going to grow them on a fallow strip of land by the sidewalk that didn't belong to us. Um, and this gesture started us doing a lot of research thinking um, about gorilla planting which then led us to the diggers. And then it was that moment that I think that eating in public was born. And can you tell us a little bit then about how it uh, both evolved as a project to involve community? I mean, what, what the intentions were behind it? Well, we were always um, suspicious of this idea of community. Um, too often it's used to actually prevent connection. Um, it's, you know, it, it gets to be very bounded, like are you or are you not a member of our community? Um, and so we really didn't like that. We, we never have seen this project as quote unquote community building. It's more about ensuring that everyone is able to live um, as freely as possible um, and, and you know, we really saw that it was important to call into question these ideas of scarcity, right? And, and to show that actually there was more than enough for everyone to have. And that the problem was not scarcity so much as it was hoarding, that <laughs> some people were hoarding all of the things that um, people need to live and denying access to most other people on the planet to those things. So we decided that rather than build community, we wanted to build the kind of social practice and, be, and ways of being in the world that would ensure that everyone could live. And I would just like to add um, a bit to that. We at the time lived in kind of a middle income suburb, um, but was very uptight and quite middle, militarized. And so I think that we, through the project, wanted to make visible things that were right there, but people, including ourselves, didn't see. Um, like who actually lived within that space. And I think that by doing the different projects, the Gorilla Gardens and the free stores and the recycling, autonomous recycling systems, it really allowed people to see the houseless people who are right there with the so-called community um, and um, people who came to these projects from the outside who also participated, who became part of the, the participants. So I think that the, just really challenges what our border imaginations. 
So, so how did it work exactly? Well, it started with the papaya seedlings um, and we, we selected papayas both because they were readily available to us, but also papayas grow very quickly in Hawaii. In a year, you actually have fruit. You have a big papaya tree with lots of fruit on it. Um, so we just thought this is a, and you know, people eat papayas here like they're going out of style. So um, we just thought this was going to be something that people wanted. They want the papayas. <laughs> It's really easy. It's easy to grow. It's easy to pick. It's easy to access. Um, and then um, we we just started expanding. Like just we started a free store in front of our house that we were renting. We were renting a, a little apartment on top of someone's garage, and we started a free store in front of it just to like not have to throw away our shit. And so we put it out there. And the landlord was who lived downstairs was initially quite skeptical of this. And he started, you know, he had very racist ideas of who would all of a sudden be coming to his house. Um, and then one day he saw something at the free store that he wanted. Um, and from and he got it. And then from there on, he was a big fan of it. And what he soon started to realize is that all his stereotypes of who wanted free things um, kind of went out the window as it became clear that um, it became clear that everyone wanted free things. And secondly, that the people who were bringing stuff for others to have were not, you know, it wasn't this hierarchical model of like the haves bring things for the have nots. It was, it was very, mutual actually everyone was bringing things everyone was taking things so that led to that and then then we encountered our first um effort to destroy us the owners of the property that we had planted the papaya seedlings on um one day we were walking by and a sign showed up and said you know dear diggers because we called ourselves the diggers after the 17th century diggers Okay. Um, in England, whose lands were being enclosed and they protested by digging up the land. Um, um, a sign appeared and said, Dear diggers, I've been told that I need to destroy these plants. Please remove them and plant them somewhere else. And we just decided to play that out um, because it was so silly. You know, why can't these papayas grow here? I mean, there was no good reason for it. So we just wrote back and said, you know, place it in public. This was stop. empty land then? It the, the was not being used for anything else? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and we wrote a sign back saying, we just can't figure out a better place to put these. So we'll just see what happens, I guess. And then they, they, they cut it down. They cut out, like, you know, these trees were growing. They're several feet tall by this point. They cut it all down. And people were outraged. Like we started hearing on the street, like, what are they doing? Why would they cut down papaya trees? Like, <laughs> what's wrong with them? So this was a brilliant opportunity for us to expand the garden. So we dug up the stumps that they left behind and just grew the garden and planted more things. And it just kept growing and growing. And people started identifying with it. Like, this is ours. You know, you can't just take it away. So that was a really good exercise in um, the, in political theater. Uh, and so it just, the project has just grown from there. But it's also about um, this idea of, of shared land being something that belongs to everyone or at least is available to everyone to use and to, to cultivate and grow things that they need. Uh, and part to, of your- To part use also to um, take care of that, that there's that sense of mutuality. Because um, I think that we all grew up in a capitalist system. So most of us don't know how to do very much besides being consumers. So I think that the projects that we have implemented, um, they're actual little pieces of comments. Um, and, and it's an opportunity for us to learn how to live in the commons while we're working on getting the whole thing across the whole globe. So I wanna add that um, in, because this is a, an, an art platform, this project has been really 
meaningful to me as an artist because it's it really has nothing to do with kind of metaphorical or symbolic strategies. It is basically what it is. Whatever I put in place, someone will alter it, which is really one of the most upsetting things for artists. So I had to kind of let go a lot of um, control about aesthetics and really embrace the crazy intervention that is on top of my own intervention. So I, I find that to be really exciting about this project. That's great. And in, and in terms of then the impact locally, apart from, as you described, the community taking a kind of ownership of this common initiative, is, is there a sense of the principle spreading? Is the practice having a tangible impact then locally? I think that the, um, the project's impact is, is probably more known outside of the so-called art world than within it. Um, we have a curbside free store that is like Grand Central Station out there. It's a very plant focused um, store and it's been adopted primarily by this gardening group on Facebook. And they're out there almost every minute of the day <laughs> adding <laughs> and exchanging from there. It's really wild. Yeah, so in this period of COVID, um, we've moved from our apartment on top of the garage into a, another place. And since COVID actually, we've really become much closer to people um, <laughs> than we ever were before. Um, there are, like as Gay said, there are people coming to our house all day long, right? <laughs> Uh, and talk, and you know, talking to us with proper physical distancing, et cetera, but constant social interaction. So we really understood that social distancing is not what is happening here. We're actually coming closer together, even though we're physically apart. Um, we are making connections with one another, and we need each other in ways that people are also not like in a capitalist society we're not taught that we need each other we think of ourselves as you know at you know atomistic individualistic beings who need to take care of themselves and what we're seeing by providing a, an opportunity to share um that people actually embrace it wholeheartedly so uh I'm sure we're driving our neighbors crazy because there's just constant <laughs> traffic now on our streets. But yeah, it's true. But even for the dinners, I noticed what you asked uh, people to do is to bring food, but food that they had grown or foraged or found or even stolen, but essentially food that they had not uh, participated in a in a kind of capitalist system of buying to in order to share. But it's to bring something that was from from their own resources. Yes. So, I mean, there's, um, there's an implicit uh, creation of a completely alternative system of bartering and sharing. Right, and maybe this is a good time for us to share a video sure. about the Diggers Project. It's always a good time. <laughs> Diggers dinners are exercises in radical sharing of food and of knowledge. They can take place in small settings amongst friends or in public and open to all. In this case, the Diggers dinner took place at a public university in Hawaii and was preceded by two weeks of demonstrations and performances centered around self-sufficiency. Examples included how to sharpen knives, clean fish, make chopsticks, simultaneous demonstrations on making kimchi and sauerkraut. The culminating event is a potluck that was open to all with only one rule. Each participant's contribution must be primarily made from ingredients that they have either grown, hunted, fished, foraged, bartered, gleaned, gifted, or stolen. At the start of the dinner, all participants are invited to explain the story of their ingredients. All leftovers were freely distributed the next day.
Great. And are these um, becoming events then that are, are being organized by others apart from uh, you? I mean, I, it's clearly initiated by you, but is there, a, again, a community and uh, taking over of that process well, too? We are very explicit that these ideas are not copywritten. So, so and encourage people to take them. And often when we do one of these dinners that people ask, when are you going to do the next one? And I say, well, when you do it, <laughs> because, um, you know, my, I am really not interested in controlling the dissemination of, of these ideas, but to just have it proliferate. Well, and the, and the, and the mark of success for eating in public is when we are no longer involved. And, and perhaps not even aware of what's happening. Like, it's basically like, please take this and do do it your, do it on your own. Or so, at least um, when you get invited to someone else's organized dinner. Right, we've never been invited to one of these. <laughs> so there is a funny story about that particular dinner because it's the largest, most public one that we, we have done. Um, Hawaii is a fairly small scale art town. So um, there's very little art writing. So um, instead of getting coverage as an art project or a food project or, or, or a political project, it was covered as a food story. And not only did we get a full page story in the, in the food or lifestyle section, they put a banner of this project on the front page news <laughs> So, so we, because of that, I got a call from the health department one day saying, what are you doing? <laughs> because um, public events have to be approved or certified by the health department. So we had to pretend that it was a private event by holding clipboards at the entrance, blank, um, blank with blank sheets of paper and welcome people like we were friends forever. Um, but because it, it was in the front page news, there are all these people that came who have never would have heard about us um, just by word of mouth. And there was this tiny woman who must have been in her 80s, maybe older. And she had brought a fold out chair with them and her, with her and she was very quiet. And at the beginning of all of our diggers there are people talk about where the their dish came from and the, the the um, source of their food. So she was the last person to speak out of, I don't know, 40, 50 people. And she was so small, she had to stand up on a little pedestal. And she got up and she said, I saw this advertised in the newspaper and I've been waiting for this all my life. <laughs> and then she said, and so I went immediately to the store and I stole some apples. <laughs> And I went to the next store and stole some bananas. <laughs> and it was just like so amazing. <laughs> like she's so radical. <laughs> oh, it, it's clearly uh, giving rise to all kinds of, uh, what do you call it, peripheral activities then in the, in the community. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but I see, uh, Gay, you're also uh, doing a lot of work around, um, I mean, maybe foraging is too broad a word for it, but at least bringing attention to the edible uh, foodstuffs that are growing wild and are available. Yeah. Um, is that a big part of your practice too? Yeah, it really started about, I would say, 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, when there was this, um, there's a rhetoric here about invasive species, um, native plants, native animals, and then um, being encroached upon by things that are deemed invasive. And alien. And alien. And, and <laughs> there are some plants here that um, are quite aggressive. But this, this term invasive has incre incrementally become any, to be understood as anything that's not native. So I became so angry about, about this that um, I became interested in edible weeds or, or, or unwanted plants. And I wanted to bring maybe understanding and value to them so people don't see them as, as um, something that needs to be 
eradicated because I think that some of the impulse is quite genocidal. So we, um, I do quite a lot of work around edible weeds, uh, foraging and also pop-up cooking demonstrations and um, curbside edible weed educational displays. I have a video for that too, if you would like to see. If it's short, yeah, we'd love to see it. Is it, you have it available? Yes, except now that it's... Um, Great. No more meeting marathons. No more email. Weeds are a spectacular movable feast. By weeds, I'm not referring to pot or pakalolo, but the regular herbaceous plants that grow everywhere where no one planted them, like your auntie's backyard next to the sidewalk, parking lots, parks, or climbing up a telephone pole. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, weeds are plants that are not valued for their use or for their beauty. Plants that grow wild and strong, so wild and strong that they can be a good accessible free alternative to what we deem to be typical produce. We've been taught to hate weeds, to do everything to get rid of them. But many weeds are edible, nutritious, and taste really good. You want to pick the tenderest parts, so just use your fingers and just feel where it easily breaks off. And that's the part you want to eat. We're rarely told about this because being able to get stuff for free is bad for capitalism. Capitalism was the first system to place food into the market, and it was able to do that by destroying the commons, the fields, the forests, the rivers, where people, the commoners, planted or gathered freely. Knowing how to eat weeds is a way for us to reclaim our freedom from capitalists and to regain our collective commons. Freedom from capitalism begins when we diminish our reliance on it. That's great. It, it reminds me here, you know, in New York, uh, there is uh, an ordinance that's prevented anyone growing food in uh, publicly owned uh, land I mean, and the i think the park service now look after 30,000 acres of parkland uh, which it's forbidden to grow anything edible um and that led i don't know i don't know if you know the mary mattingly project swale because there's a, a different law uh that affects kind of what's called common marine law she she repurposed a barge as a kind of floating food forest, which she could move around around the city, but just located at little uh, docks and ports, so people could uh, pick food for free from the the barge because it wasn't subject to the same ordinance that the land had. But yeah. is there a, is there a similar issue in uh, in Hawaii? Absolutely. Um, the reason we called our project Eating in Public actually was to not only call into question, you know, capitalism, but also the state. Uh, so we wanted to make it clear that the public was not an alternative to the private, but that it actually was part of the same system of enclosing the commons. Um, so the idea of the public is only useful for those people who also have a great deal uh, invested in the private, right? So if you have a private place to grow your food, then you love the public parks. But if you don't have that, then the public is not available to you to grow your food, to sleep in, to you know um, live in. Mm. Uh, as, you know, and Honolulu actually has the highest per capita rate of houselessness in the United States. Um, and they have incredibly um, um, violent and, um, you know, uh, draconian uh, anti-houseless laws. You're not allowed to lie. You're not allowed to sit. You're not allowed to live in public spaces 
with the assumption being that you have somewhere private to go off to, which, you know, very, uh, a growing number of people do not hear. So we, in this project, we wanted to make trouble with capitalism. And we also wanted to make trouble with the state and make it clear that the state was not a solution to the, you know, rapacious marketplace that actually both of them had to um, go in order to reveal the commons for us. Right. I would have to say that um, the, the politics that Nandita just went over is not very explicit to a lot to I think the great majority of the participants and I think that their minds are changed just by them engaging with the works itself so I've noticed that ever since we have the plant free stores um, now there are five others that have started on this island uh, because of the enthusiasm and them seeing that it's worked so well and then there are you know very kind of proper people who who have now started digging through other people's trash to find plants so that they can take them to the free stores. So I think that, um, that those change of just what people do in daily life, I think have some impact to empathies and solidarity with, with people that maybe previously they didn't find to be like them. So I think that that part is important. Well, and, key, and just related to, you know, the theme of uh, this year's arts link radical hospitality, what becomes really evident in all of eating in public's projects evident to the people who use the projects is that the projects could not exist without the stranger. Right, that and so it's it's also, a, you know, circling back to the start of this conversation, calling into question our kind of usual ways of understanding community. None of our projects would work if a someone, if a stranger was not bringing you things or if a stranger was not taking the stuff that you're hoping will disappear from the front of your lawn. Um, so it really expands and hopefully um, uh, makes it evident to people in their everyday practices that the stranger is necessary uh, not just um, uh, something to be feared or something to be pitied, um, which is the usual way that we approach them. Right, because it's not a charity project. It's multi, multi directional or the, the giving is it's very often bottom up. No, and it also shows that, you know, the stranger is someone who has uh, things to share and offer and give, you know, equally to you. You know, it's a sense of it building this level of uh, a sense of equity amongst uh, a community and connecting us to people who we may not have met before, but who we know uh, we have many things to share and and to uh, to offer things to. Right, and quite unexpected, who they are. Yeah. Well, and sometimes completely unknown. Right, yeah. so you don't know who just took all of those things that you were hoping to get rid of, or who brought you this beautiful treasure that you want now. Uh, so it could be anybody. Uh, For a while, um, frozen chicken kept showing up at one of the free stores, and people were like having discussion, like, "Well, should we throw it away? What about botulism?" So there was so much discussion. And one day, I I saw the person who brought it, and um, he was a houseless person who I've uh, who I've known before. And I said, well, Loy, why are you bringing chicken? He said, you know, he said, well, because I go to the food bank and they give me a box of stuff and I don't have a kitchen. So I'm just giving the chicken away. <laughs> so, and it's because of Loy's chicken that we started a free fridge component next to the free store to accommodate things like, you know, things like his. The cold ones. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we need to go, but uh, Gay and Nandita, thank you so much for making uh, radical hospitality not only tangible, but clearly an important part of uh, many people's lives. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Simon.